So the problem of financing of cooperation, the problem comes down to a, a maximization of this objective function, which is discounted value of a cash flow, a difference between what's going out and what is coming in, and that becomes the value of the firm. So, so one of the one of the one of the most in most of the one of the most difficult thing to understand is why is this value of the firm? And I think we already talked about quite a bit on this one, but there is other literature in finance that will also justify this particular equation or this objective function. So once we have, once we agree that this is the objective function, we already derived the state equation and the constraints, we have a control problem in our hand. And the, the idea now for a fixed time T, we need to find out the optimal control U and a V. Okay. Okay, so now what we do, is we formulate a current value of the Hamiltonian. And so this is our integrand, lambda times, this is our state equation. And then what we do is we 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 simplify this so that the so that the so the so the X term is outside. The recording has reached the maximum length. To replay your message, press one. To delete and re-record your message, press three. For delivery options, press four. To send a fax, press six. To cancel this message, press star. To send this message now, press pound or hang up. That was a call to Kushali, I'm sorry. <clears throat> okay. So what we do is <clears throat> we collect the value. This is this is this is this is the Hamiltonian that we want to maximize at each point in time. And lambda dot, which is the <clears throat> adjoint equation is now, remember now we're using the current value formulation, so there's e to the minus rho t. Because the current value formulation, we have rho dot, lambda dot equal to rho lambda minus the Hamiltonian derivative with respect to x, and what, what is with respect to x just comes down to this value here. Okay. It's a free endpoint problem. You notice there is no salvage value here. This, was, this form basically disappears at time t. And because of that, the value lambda t equal to zero because there is no value of x at time t, capital T. So now what we do is we define, we have a w1 here, that's a w2. We can define the switching function. The switching function can be written as w1 u plus w2 u plus one times x, where w1 is the cr lambda minus one, and W2 is R lambda minus one. Notice now that <clears throat> the optimal policy is a combination of generalized bang bang and singular controls. What, what I mean by that is because the value function, the Hamiltonian is linear in U and V. And remember in chapter, uh, the previous chapter, when we talked about generalization of bang bang control, so if it is just the one variable, then the bang bang control will be de just depends on the sign of w1. If it's just one variable v, v, then the bang bang depends on the sign of basically w2. And the, always a singular control when w2 is zero, the v becomes singular, w1 zero, u becomes singular. But now we have two variables and two variables gives you a kind of a linear programming problem. And so the bang bang becomes what is called the extreme point uh, of the simplex. We will talk about that very soon. We will show that very quickly what's going on. And so the character, the, the characters of these optimal control now in terms of adjoint variable becomes a linear programming problem. I, I use the word parametric here because the lambda is going to change. So the problem is a linear programming in a parameter lambda that's going to change. And there is a whole theory of parametric linear programming that allows you to solve the problem of linear programming as lambda changes. So that's what it means by parametric linear programming problem. So we'll see how that goes. So the Hamiltonian maximization problem now is like a linear programming problem, which is maximize this particular quantity, which is, sorry, which is W1 
uh, sorry, W1, W1 U plus W2 times U, maximize this over U and V. Uh, these are not functions anymore. U and V are just simply variables here, okay? Because it, this is at each point in time T. Subject to U bigger than zero, that means dividend has to be positive. And uh, no, the, the, the dividend has to be positive. The, the, no, the, the external earning is between zero and one, so dividend has to be plus zero, and external equity, U equal bigger than equal to zero. And an external equity has a flotation cost of CU plus V, which is kind of a, kind of a, something to do with the growth rate that has to be less than G divided by R. So we have a variable in linear programming problem, two variables and three constraints. To solve this problem, we require two cases. The two cases depends on whether the growth rate is less than the rate of return, the growth rate is bigger than the rate of return. Okay, uh, we'll see why those two cases are important and we will take these cases one by one. So let's look at the solution of this problem, which is a very simple problem. Uh, a linear programming problem in two dimension can be solved geometrically. You can write the constraints in a geometric situation, find a feasible solution, and, and then try to figure out how this particular quantity is maximized over this particular set, okay? So let's, let's, let's uh, before we go to this table, let's go to a case A where G is less than R. When G is less than R, we have a constraint U bigger than zero, which is basically U bigger than zero means we are somewhere Okay, u is bigger than zero. And v is bigger than zero. So v is bigger than zero on this line, u is bigger than zero on this line. And so u bigger than zero, v bigger than zero is this whole quadrant. But v is between zero and, and one. Okay, so v can only go from here up to here. So the, the, the value of v can only go on this stage when u equal to zero and here from here. But there's a constraint. You see, there's a constraint, which is a constraint here. And if you plot that constraint, that constraint is given by this line. So you can see that one is here. G by R is here because G is less than R. Remember, this is case A. Case A, G is less than R. So G by R is less than one. And when u is zero, then v equal to g by r. You look at when u equal to zero, v then can be equal to g by r, that is the upper boundary. And when you, v, when, 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 so that's when u equal to zero, g by r. And when v equal to zero, then u is g divided by cr. So you see when, when v equal to zero, g equal to u, u equal to g divide, gc divided by r. G divided by RC, okay? So now we have, what we are now trying to say is the feasible solution of this linear programming problem is given, the feasible set is this defined by this, this three equation. It is called a simplex. So this, these are the three equations and, and the area that is enclosed by these three equations is called a simplex, of course, the simplex would be more complicated than just a triangle, but in this case, it happens to be a triangle. So that is case A. Why case G is different? Case B is different because case B, this G by R is bigger than one. When G by R is bigger than one, I'm only allowed V to be less than one. So you see what happens? So just let's go to the next case B. So see now G by R is here and it is bigger than one. So when it's bigger than one, we can only go up to here. We cannot go here. So there's another another constraint that comes, which is V less than equal to one. And so V less than equal to given is this equation right here. And, and so what happens is our feasible space shrinks. So the feasible space for case B is given by this simplex. This simplex is now bounded by these four lines. And any, any, any solution between 
any solution in this in this region and along these lines is feasible. How do you solve the linear programming problem in this geometric setting? Is like this. You draw a line. So you said W1 U, W1 times U plus W2 times U equal to a constant. If you put that equal to a constant, that, that is a line that is a linear line in this space. Okay. And so suppose that linear line is like this. And it, the line is this, and as W1 and W2, so what happens is, so the line is like this, and every point along this line is a feasible solution that we are interested in, and its value is, its value is K, because W1, W1 U plus W2 times V equal to K. So all those points of U and V gives you the value K for this objective function. Now I want to increase K because I want to maximize. So I move this line, parallel line. I, 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 can, I can do, I don't know how to show it, but <clears throat> you, 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 you roll this line up all the way up to here. And that is, and beyond that, you will go out of feasible reason. So this point becomes the optimal solution for that, li that line, that line, li line like that. If the line W1, W2 was like this, this will become the boundary point and the maximum. If line was like this, the maximum will go to here. So what I'm trying to say is that these are called the extreme points. This point, this point, this point, a corner point, and any of other these points are called extreme points. So regardless of how, what is the slope of this line, the optimal solution will be an extreme point. In some cases, it is possible that the line is exactly parallel to one of these lines. So suppose W1, W2 constant was line like this. If the line was like this, rolling up will actually line will coincide with this and any further movement will go out of the feasible set. So that means any of the solution along this line is optimal. <clears throat> and this is a singular control in some sense because any of the solution is optimal here. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what are we doing now so far? We solve this problem for different value of W1, W2 because different value of W1 will W2 will come because the lambda will change. So whatever the value of W1, W2 is, given those values, we can get a line Given that line, we can get an optimal solution for case A and case B, and I write this table. So when W2 is less than zero, and W2 is equal to zero, then, no, there's one more thing here, why we forgot W1. Let me see why, why we, we don't put W1. And the reason is this. Now that W1 is C times R lambda minus one, and W2 is R lambda minus one, and a C is less than equal to one. In fact, it's strictly less than one in our case, okay? So that means that if this guy is positive, then W1 is always gonna be less than W2, right? If this guy is negative, that's a different story. So what's going on is you can always show that when W2 is less than zero, when W2 is less than zero, then W1 will always be less than zero, right? Because if this is less than zero, then this is, this is gonna be less than one. And what is going on is that this is gonna be less than one. C times R lambda is even gonna be less than R lambda. So W1 will be more negative. So what I'm trying to say is that when W2 is less than zero, we all also know that W1 is less than zero and the solution will be given by the extreme point A1, which is given here as this particular point. Because when W1 and W, when W1 and W2 both are less than zero, the line is gonna go move that way and the optimal solution will be exactly at zero, zero. Okay? So, by going through these conditions, we can find the optimal solution by geometry using these two graphs. And once you find the geometry, you can create a table. 
So that sort of says that the table gives you case A1, in case A1, U star and U V star equal to zero. Case A1 is given by W2 less than zero because that's basically gives you case A1 uh, and, and the optimal solution U star V star equal to zero. Look at case A2. Case A2 says U star equal to zero and V star is anywhere between this. So what does that mean? That says, let's take the case A1, A2, A2 G by R is less than one. So this is zero less than V star less than equal to one. So U star equal to zero and V star is between zero and one. Notice that that means the optimal solution is along this line. It could be here, 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 all the way up to here. That is the, that is the line. Why I say mean of one by G by R because I also want to cover B2. In B2, G by R is, is bigger than one. So mean of these guys is, no, G by R is less than one. Mean of these guys, G by R. So in B2, you see the control will be anywhere from here to here. Nothing here, just from here to here. So by going this, you can sort of write a table. The table basically gives you the optimal solution of this linear programming problem for any given value of W1 and W2. So whenever you have a value of W1 and W2 given, and, and, and I remove the W1 because in many cases, I don't need W1 because W2 less than zero will automatically give me the value of W1 that will allow me to conclude this. Only in one case, I need W1 less than zero, W2 bigger than zero, which gives me case of B3. In case of B3, the control is U star equal to one, V star equal to one. Uh, so, So we, we have solved the Hamiltonian maximization problem. We have not solved the optimal control problem, because optimal control problem has a lambda, lambda, which is changing. So when you change U and a V, and initial, and the terminal condition of lambda is zero, this is, becomes a differential equation, which will give me the value of lambda when I solve it. And when I get a value of lambda, that will give me the value of W1 and W2. And when, when I get a W1 and W2, I go to this table and I find out the control at that time t. But what happens the next time? The well, next time it may go from here to here because W may change. So, so now what we are gonna do is we have to synthesize the optimal control, which means we have to try to sequence how these controls come about over time. Okay. Now you can you can solve this problem using the Excel method. It is possible to do it. But this particular problem is so simple that we can actually do an analytical solution. And so we're gonna we're gonna do analytical solution to this problem and Part of the reason I give this problem in this book is because we are, I'm gonna teach you, I'm not teaching you finance. I, I'm giving a finance example to teaching you control theory. And in control theory, there is something called the switching point analysis, which allows you to solve the problem, uh, in some cases, analytical, okay? And this is one of the examples where that happens. So that's what I'm gonna do now. I'm now gonna go, so, are there any questions? We, we have now come to the point where the Hamiltonian maximization problem becomes a simple linear programming problem, which can be solved simply by inspection. And when we solve that by inspection, you notice here, uh, when you solve that problem by inspection, we, we, uh, we uh, 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 go to the next stage of switching point analysis. Switching point analysis starts from here. The first thing I want to do in the switching point analysis is do what is called the reverse time. The reason I do reverse time is because I'm going to solve this problem. I'm going to solve this lambda dot problem. I'm going to solve this differential equation. But this differential equation doesn't have an initial value. It has a terminal value. 
So I can go backward starting from zero. I can go backward to solve this problem as I find u and v. OK, so let's 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 continue on this. Please ask me a question anytime you have a question. You can interrupt me anytime you want. So the first thing we do in solving a differential equation is we define a reverse time. The reverse time tau is t minus t. Okay, so anytime t, the tau is a reverse time of that. So when t goes from zero to t, tau goes from t. Tau, when tau goes from zero to t, it means t goes from t to zero. Okay, so that's the reason. The reason is that I want to solve the problem in forward time tau, but backward time t. Okay, so 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 I'm sorry. Forward time t and a backward time tau. I want to solve the problem in backward time tau, and the backward time is given like this. So when lambda t equal to t is lambda tau equal to zero equal to zero, and the differential equation I can write as y circle. Y circle is dy d tau. D by D tau is nothing but D by DT, D, DT by D tau, which is minus Y dot. So what happens now is that any differential equation can be changed into a differential equation in backward time, which is different in terms of tau, by using, instead of a dot, using a circle, and the circle is just minus Y dot. So now we have a, so we will have a differential equation lambda circle, whose initial condition, because now it's in terms of tau, whose initial condition is zero. Okay? And the initial condition of xt, well, what is initial condition of xt? Look at xt. Here's the x dot equation. Okay? And I can write that also in x circle. And the x circle, I have an initial condition, but as x circle of zero, which is the, condition of x at time capital T, we don't know that. So we're going to make a guess. Remember our solution of the Excel? What we don't know, we make a guess. So in the Excel, what we did was we made a guess of lambda zero, and we solved the equation forward time because we had x zero in the beginning and a lambda zero in the beginning, which is the guess. And given the two values, one guess and one this one, we, we do forward time. Now what we do is we have a lambda, lambda tau zero equal to zero. So we have a lambda tau zero equal to zero. And we have a xt, which is x zero in terms of tau. We don't have any value of that. So we're going to make a guess. So we're going to make the value of the guess x tau equal to zero as some alpha a. a means case A, B will be case B, okay? So we make a guess alpha A. So now I have an initial initial problem, initial value problem like this. I have an X circle equal to that. Remember now that will be X of tau, okay? Because everything is in terms of tau now. And initial condition, in the, now I'm gonna talk initial condition, because it's a reverse time. So the initial condition, the reverse time problem is alpha A. An initial condition of reverse time problem, lambda zero is zero. So now that becomes our two point boundary value problem where we are solving it backward. We can also do in Excel. We can actually give this problem to Excel and starting a guess of X instead of lambda and continue. So what is what is what are we gonna do? We're gonna solve this problem in, in for when tau increases from zero to capital T. And when we go all the way to capital T, what happens? X of capital T in the forward time is X of tau at T will be, will be exactly X zero, which is given to us. And that will be some number. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna find the alpha A so that initial value in terms of real time T becomes X zero. So essentially the two point one problem where the guessing is taking place here. And then we solve the problem and we, we because of that guess, we try to figure out whether the solution, when we end the solution, whether the, one of the conditions for X becomes this, okay? 
So we want to make that guess of alpha A so that, so, we want to make that guess of alpha A so that when I solve the problem in tau variable, which is, which is the time tau, that the value at the end of this X will be X zero, okay? So that's our problem. So we are now solving a two point binary value problem, not by Excel, but analytically. Okay, that's the reason why this particular chapter is around here. So how do we do that? I give you first a little hint, and then I'll give you, go back to the solution to see what is going on so that you know what, what you, you can understand things somewhat easier. So let's let's see what is going on. Okay. That basically says that we don't have in case A, we don't have these cases in case A. We only have A1, A2, and A3. Okay. Notice V star equal to one is is never applicable because we are either V star equal to zero or we have V star is between min of one and G by R, okay? But G by R is less than one. So if you write this condition for A2, that will be zero less than V star G by R. So, and here it is gonna be V star by G, V star equal to G by R also. That means V star equal to one is never a constraint. It is never gonna be encountered. So we don't have to worry about we star less than equal to one constraint. That constraint is superfluous because we will never need it. Okay. It is taken, it is taken over by a constraint V less than equal to G divided by R. And G divided by R being less than one, that constraint is dominant compared to this. So we don't need this constraint. It's a redundant constraint actually. Now, what is W10 and W20 in this case? Well, lambda is zero. When lambda is zero, this is zero, this is zero. So W1 is minus one, W2 is minus one. When W2 and W1 are minus one, we are in this case, okay? And our control is U star equal to zero, V star equal to zero. We are actually in this case, W1 less than zero, W2 less than zero. And right now is the optimal solution in the case A1 is zero, zero. Remember, we, in table we only say W2 less than zero, but when W2 less than zero, W1 less than zero is implied because of the C less than one. So we have U star equal to zero, V star equal to zero is our solution. W2 is less than zero, so we are in case one, and we have a solution U star, V star equal to zero. We substitute U star, U star zero into this equation, and we get our differential equation, X circle zero equal to zero, and lambda circle is one minus rho lambda. So, we can assume by continuity that u star equal to v star equal to zero will stay at least for a little bit amount of time. So we can solve this equation up to the point, because as we solve this equation, lambda is changing. And as lambda is changing, w1, w2 is changing. So we can solve this equation as long as W1, W2 remain less than zero because they're strictly less than zero. They will stay less than zero for a small amount of time, at least for a small amount of time. So we can do the differential equation. We solve the equation for this amount of time. And we can keep doing that until one of these guys changes. And we will see that when it changes, I'm sorry, we have a different picture. We'll see that it changes, we will see that because that one is gonna be less than that one. So the first thing that's gonna change is W2 will become zero. So 
we will keep the case A1 and keep solving the equation until we get to case A2. And there will be a time at which we switch to A2. Okay, and then once we switch to A2, we will see how far we can go on A2 until we get to A3. Okay, so those are our, those. this is what I'm trying to do now. As time goes, how our solution is going from A1 to A2 to A3. It might go back to A1, but because of the monotonicity of the situation here, we can show that it will not come back again to A1. So that's not important. It will automatically come as a part of the switching point solution anyway. So we solve this. We solve this, this is remain constant. So it will be exactly alpha A because it was beginning with alpha A and it, its F circle is zero, so alpha A. This is a first order equation and we can solve that. And we know lambda zero equal to zero. Now I'm talking about tau, tau, tau time only. Let me talk about tau time only unless I tell you to, to talk about T time, okay? So if I don't say anything, it's tau, okay? So lambda tau is like this. So now we know that this is our condition for C. W2 is, W2 is less than zero, then W1 is definitely going to be less than zero. We already know this. So to maintain in this subcase, as tau will increase, W2 tau must remain negative. Okay? For some time tau as tau increases. So we're going to look at W2 tau to see what happens to W2 tau. So we're going to, we're going to keep seeking what happens to this lambda tau. And, and W2 is R lambda minus 1. So as lambda tau, as lambda changes, this W2 will change. And we will try to see what happens to W2 we will see that at some time it becomes zero. So this will, this is the next thing that's coming up. Since R is bigger than rho, there exists a tau one such that this is equal to zero. And when you set this equal to zero, you solve for tau one, and tau one becomes this number. Remember, R is bigger than rho is needed because if R is not bigger than rho, then if R is less than rho, then this quantity becomes negative and the logarithm has no meaning. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, we, 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 we assume, um, since we already assume R bigger than rho, otherwise the company should not be in business, we already assume R bigger than rho, and R bigger than rho, everything, this logarithm is defined properly because this quantity is positive. So we have a tau one. That is the value of tau one as W2 becomes zero. That means that if tau one is not larger than T, then we have gone all the way up to tau one on, in this tau direction, and I haven't reached this point yet. Tau has not gone to t yet. So I have found a solution from some time to some time, uh, okay? And, and so, so this is one, but what if t is not sufficiently large? What if t is less than tau one? Well, then we know the optimal solution because we already gone all the way to, all the way to T and everywhere the control is zero, zero. So if T is not sufficiently large, then the problem is totally solved and our optimal solution is U star, V star zero. We'll talk about why this is so later. Okay. It basically means this firm has not enough time to give enough dividend to people to be worthwhile because dividend has given at a certain rate. And, and if I give you some money, I, they will not give me back the dividend, which will com compensate for my money. And 
and given that, it's also clear that there's no reason to to raise any money from outside stockholders because that to return them their money is more expensive because it costs us money to to to, to issue new stock. So remark 5.2 says that if tau one is bigger than t, then the problem is solved and the solution is trivial. U star equal to zero, V star equal to zero. Okay. When you say not sufficiently large, if somebody gives you an ex exercise or a, a exam problem where you say, assume this term is not sufficiently large. In this case, if I told you, assume T sufficiently large, you cannot assume T less than tau one. Because T less than tau one, you will give me an optimal solution, zero, zero, and you will write this exam solution. And I will not give you more than one out of 10 points. So you have to assume T bigger than, when I said this, you have to assume T sufficiently large so that its solution is interesting and not trivial. Okay. The second is if R is less than rho, clearly the firm should not be in a business in any case and the problem is uninteresting anyway. And so we don't need to solve that problem anyway. That's why we assume R bigger than rho. So what happens is that we have now come to this point. Okay, W1 is less than zero, W2 is equal to zero. And when that happens, if you go to the table, this is W2 equal to zero, and the solution is given by this. So now what happens is if you go to the triangle, we go from zero to solution along this line, any point along this line. And any plot along this line is given by this control. U star is zero, no external equity, and a dividend can be anywhere between zero and G by R. Notice, in a singular control, in one example, we told you that while when there's a singular control, the Hamiltonian maximization problem does not give you the value of V star. It only tells you it can be anywhere between these numbers. What is then given, what specifies this, is can we maintain that V star in this range? To maintain V star in this range, I have to maintain W2 equal to zero. To maintain W2 equal to zero, I have to maintain lambda equal to whatever it was. Okay? And that then gives me the value of V. If there is such a V over time that allows me this condition to remain, then that V becomes the solution. So that V becomes specified. What we do here, we can sort of see that we want to maintain this for finite interval. This means that W2 circle should be zero. This means lambda two circle should be zero for a while at least. And, and lambda circle is given by one minus V star minus lambda rho minus V star where V star is that number. And we can find that lambda exactly is one divided by R because lambda, lambda circle, lambda has to be one by R. We want to maintain this should be equal to zero. And the value of lambda here is one by R. You can see that by 18 to zero. So I can put lambda equal to one by R here. And when I do that, I can find out that the only time I can maintain this lambda circle equal to zero is if R equal to rho. So if R equal to rho, it doesn't matter whether I get dividend or not give dividend, because if I get a dividend, I get it. If I not get a dividend, I'm earning money exactly equal to dividend, and I will get that dividend, that money anyway. On the other hand, that, that is again kind of a trivial solution. But in a trivial solution, it says that I can be, uh, it says that I can be, after I leave zero, zero, I can be anywhere on this line. But we don't assume that. This is kind of a degenerate case. Okay? We're assuming R bigger than rho. And if R is bigger than though the lambda circle is going to be strictly bigger than zero, no matter what, at tau one. That means after tau one, I can 
only maintain this particular condition only for zero amount of time. So after tau one, the case sub case A2 cannot be sustained for more than a zero amount of time. And then because of this is bigger than zero, W2 become bigger than zero immediately after tau one. And when W2 bigger than zero, I am case three. And a case three gives U star equal to zero, V star equal to Z by R. So what happens is, in reverse time, we started here. Then we along went to A2, but only can be stay at zero time. And then you go to A3. After A3, we want to see whether we want to go back here or whether A3 can be staying forever, whatever. That is something we haven't done yet, but we will do that next. So now I want to go, and I'll tell you that we will show that once you're A3, you can maintain A3 forever. And once you can maintain forever, you can certainly maintain up to capital T. The MS problem is solved. So this is what happens. Let me tell you what now, and we'll come back to here, but I want to go forward to tell you what we did so far. So this is what we did. <clears throat> we started here. We started here, and this is the tau one. And, and so t is t minus tau one, Ta tau is going this way, so tau equal to zero, tau equal to one, and tau equal to t. t equal to zero, t equal to t minus tau one, t equal to t. So let's go tau first. So what we've shown that for tau from zero to tau one, the control is u star v star equal to zero. And this is case A2, right at that point. At that point, we can only sustain at one point in time, and so we will eventually go to case A3. So as soon as we move beyond tau one, we are in case A3. And case A3, U star equal to zero, that means no external equity. V star equal to G by R, that means part of the earning is paid as dividend. When part of the earning is paid as a dividend, the remaining part can be easily shown to be, the remaining part is invested. So because it's being invested, it's earning money, X will grow in some way. We'll show why it goes this way but X grows some way. So in tau, we will see that X is gonna go down. In this direction, it's gonna go down. And we will go all the way down this until we come to this point. And this point will be our initial value corresponding to alpha A. So if I alpha A was here, I will go like this and I will go like this. This will be my value. If alpha A was here, I will go like this, go like this, and I come here. If alpha A was here, Okay, I will go like this. And if alpha A was here, I will go like this and go like this and go like this. So you can see different alpha A gives you different value of initial condition for state. So there's only one value of alpha A that will map this trajectory into X zero. So once I solve this problem, I can find out where I land up. And, and I can want to make sure that that is X zero, I will find out the value of alpha A. And I have essentially solved the two point binary value problem analytically. <clears throat> what does that mean in forward time? So in forward time, what happens is you should begin with X zero, and then you pay a part of your earning as dividend. You let the company grow up to time T minus tau one. And at that point, you switch and pay, pay, keep no return earnings, which means full dividend. That means no external equity and pay everything as dividend. If you pay everything as a dividend, then company is not going to grow. So it's going to stay exactly, the company is going to stay exactly at alpha A, and then we are done. There's no salvage value of this, this value. And so, so company is liquidated. It has no liquidation value and we are done. So that's, that's the part of 
case A. Case B is a little bit more complicated. We'll talk about that later. But now let's go and finish our. So we are at A3. The optimal control is U star equal to zero, V star equal to G by R. So the 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 the, the reverse time differential equations are X circle is minus G X. This is still alpha A because we haven't we haven't gone on X anyway because V star was V star was zero. And so 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 X will stay exactly that alpha A, which is also you, I show you the diagram. And lambda circle is given by this quantity, and lambda tau one is exactly one by r given by that particular quantity here. So what I'm trying to say is that we are at this point, and now we're examining what happens as tau increases from tau one. We want to show what is happening here. Okay, so we're going to we're going to do that right now. Lambda circle is bigger than zero. So lambda is increasing at tau one from its value one by r. And it will show that the way the behavior happens depends on whether rho is bigger than g or whether rho is smaller than less than or equal to g. Because remember the term here rho, rho minus g that rho minus g in case one is positive and in case two is negative. And how this lambda changes depends on the difference between these two. But this is always positive. But this quantity can become negative or positive. I'm, I'm in the whole this quantity because it's minus. But if this becomes negative, this becomes plus. So this quantity can change sign. So the, the way lambda will circle, will, lambda will change beyond tau one in reverse time, tau depends on these two cases. So we'll take these two cases one by one. First case is rho bigger than g. If rho is bigger than g, lambda increases, then lambda circle decreases. Remember, rho bigger than g is this quantity, so this is negative. When this is negative, so you will see that the lambda circle decreases and becomes zero at a value obtained by equating the right-hand side of 5.41, which is this to zero. So we equate the right-hand side, this right-hand side, this right-hand side here to zero, and we get this value, lambda bar equal to one minus G by divided by rho minus G. That is the that is asymptotic value. That is the asymptotic value of 5.41. So starting at one by R, since R is bigger than rho and rho is bigger than G, W2 bar asymptotically is R lambda bar minus one is bigger than zero. That means that all the way to infinity, not just to capital T, this W will remain bigger than zero. Because even at the very end, it's equal to equal, it's bigger than zero, which means that in the case of rho bigger than G, this solution can stay forever and certainly can stay up to capital T. So when tau goes all the way to capital T, that solution can stay. So we are done for that. What happens when this case happens? I will talk more about this formula. This formula is a famous formula in finance. Way before finance people did any control theory. I'll talk a little bit more about it because I have some personal interest in it too. Rho less than or equal to G. Lambda tau increases, but lambda circle also increases. So W tau actually continues to increase. all the way to infinity. So certainly we will remain some case A3. So in both cases we will sum in some case A3, but the reason I did these two cases is because I have some meaning to assign to this quantity and I have some optimal control uh, issues that are related to this, this particular aspect. So those are the reasons 
I, I satisfy, I, I break this down into two. <clears throat> now we have a solution. The solution is given by this. So I can go back, I can go starting from the beginning. Now I switch the time back to small t. When I switch the time to small t, well, uh, it hasn't, it hasn't, right now, um, um, when I switch the time to small t, I have, I can begin with x0, and when I, I'm growing at rate g, because by my, my x, x circle, notice what happens, sorry, 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 sorry. x circle is, x circle is minus gx, so x dot is plus gx, which means the, the, the x is growing at the rate g. If x is growing at the rate g, then x at t minus tau one will be exactly e x zero times e to the g, t minus tau one. Okay, we already know, we already know the value of tau one, so I can substitute value of tau one, this value of tau one, where is the tau one? This value of tau one, which is in terms of r and rho, I can substitute this value of tau one, and I substitute this value of tau one, I can get this formula. Because this is e to the gt divided by e to the g tau one, and e to the g tau one, because the log, it becomes some number. Okay, e to the log a is, e to the log a is a, right? So that's what happens here. For rho less than g, lambda tau increases to infinity. As to, uh, this is important implication when we look at the infinite problem, because when t goes to infinity, we may run into this situation. We can write the whole solution. From zero to t minus tau one, u is zero, v is g by r, x is given by this. From t minus tau one to t, u is zero, v is zero, x will remain this value because x will remain uh, the value that I had a t minus tau one and we are here. Notice that whatever alpha a is, I can make alpha a into x zero. So, so if alpha a was not this number, I will have a I will have another line. If alpha a was different than this number, then if it was here, I will go like this, go like this, or I will go this like this. But regardless of what it is, I have this equation and I can find out the exact alpha a. Okay, so I can, uh, I, I find, I solve the problem basically. Lambda t can be also solved. Lambda t is given by this formula for t from zero to t minus tau one is given by this formula. And so the lambda t uh, can be obtained exactly for all the values of, uh, uh, this is from t tau minus t and this is from t to t minus tau one. So problem is completely solved. Um, so, interesting aspects now, intuition and also method, financial interpretation. This formula <clears throat> looks kind of, it's interesting, but it immediately doesn't tell you anything. It doesn't tell you why this time is so special. What is going on at this time? That after this time, after t minus tau one, I I don't need to do. I don't put any dividend. I don't use any extra equity. And u and v are zero. I stop growing. Why? So let's see why that happens. If you did not know control theory. It is probably possible to solve this problem this way. And, 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 and so let's see what is the meaning of this. First, we 
we learn from our analysis that it requires at least this amount of time to retain a dollar of earnings to be worthwhile for investment. What, what am I trying to say here? I'm trying to say that this is the amount of time from here to here. This is the amount of time which I call tau one. I need this amount of time for me to, to retain any earnings. Because remember, I'm retaining earnings here. I'm retaining no earnings here. This is the point, at one point, I'm indifferent. Remember at one point, <clears throat> this was the optimal solution at one point. At one point, I can have zero, which is on the right side of tau, 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 that, that point, or I can have G by R, which is the left side of it, or I can have in between. That means I'm indifferent between retaining and not retaining. That's what it means by that. So this particular point is exactly the point in time whether I'm indifferent between earning being retained, earning not being retained. Okay? That means any dollar I retain here pays for itself. Any dollar I retain here will not pay for itself. It will hurt the stockholder because that money will not be paid out as dividend. It will pay out a dividend only from here to here. But you need this much time for that money to be worthwhile. Okay, that's what that's trying to say. So think about it. If you're close to, if you're close to capital T and the company, let's say you're one, one, one second close to T for, for argument's sake. And somebody asks you to put one dollar into this company. Well, how much dividend can they give you in one second? In one second, the dividend is the rate of G by R. This is the dividend rate, or one minus by this is the earnings of one minus G by R is dividend. Well, in one second, you're not going to get back your dollar. You're going to lose out 99.9 .9 cents of it. Right, you probably get one cent in dividend for that one or two seconds. I'm just giving you some numbers, but, but you can sort of see what's going on. So there must be some amount of time for me to be justifying my dollar investment. We now found out that that sufficient amount of time is exactly tau one. This is the only point before which I should invest money. After that, I should not invest. So why that happens? So let's see why that happens. Suppose the firm retain $1 of earning at time t minus tau one. So I'm now saying, suppose I retain $1 of earning at this time tau. What happens? Well, notice what happens. I, re I just invested $1 and I'm, as soon as I invest $1, I'm already in this regime. This is done. I'm in this regime, right? And what is happening in this regime? All the earning is being paid out of the, as a dividend, okay? All the earnings are paid out of the dividend. So this $1 is gonna earn R amount of earning, okay? And that R amount of earning will all be paid out as dividend because nothing is being retained. V star equal to zero. <clears throat> so that $1 will give me a dividend at the rate of R, right? Any questions so far? Okay, so I'm going to run the dividend rate at R and I'm going to run dividend, I'm going to get that dividend from zero to tau one, right? Because starting from zero, this is now my forward time. I get $1, I get a rate R, so I'm going to I'm going to get this dividend all the way up to tau one. So my total value of the dividend will be the present value of that dividend integrated from zero to tau one. So I'm integrating this. I'm going to integrate that from zero to tau one r <coughs> e to the minus rho s ds s going from zero to tau one. 
that integral is exactly this integral. Okay, but I want the present value of this this you know e dividend should be equal to the dollar that I just paid out. So I paid out a dollar here, and I'm I, in in return I'm getting an inter dividend at rate r, and the present value of that dividend at this time at this time should be exactly equal to dollar because I'm indifferent between putting that money or not putting that money. So it has to be exactly equal to $1. That means that has to be exactly equal to $1. If you equate that equal to $1, you will see you will get this formula. This formula. And you can see easily. Uh, let's go even further. So if you equate that to dollar, okay, First, you bring that side to this side, that becomes rho divided by r, okay? Then you bring this side, that becomes rho divided by r minus one. And then you multiply by minus, you get e to the minus rho tau is one divided by one, one minus that. And then, then tau one becomes the log of that. And then one by rho, it gets divided by one by rho. So you can see this formula is exactly this formula. <clears throat> one by rho, log of r, r minus rho, times one divided by rho. So you see there's an intuitive meaning of this tau one. Notice, I solved this problem using control theory. I found this formula using maximum principle. But now I can see what is the meaning of that tau one by using financial argument. With this interpretation of tau, we conclude that enough earning must be retained so as to make the firm grow exponentially at the maximum rate of G until this. Because if this is an indifference point, then if I have a dollar here, I'm even better off. I get more than a dollar because at some point I will get a dividend a little bit of dividend, <clears throat> and then I'll get a full dividend. So the company's value will continue to grow. Since G is less than R, the growth in the first half of the solution can be financed. So what does that mean, what is saying? Because G is less than R, and I cannot grow faster than G, then I can grow the company only by retaining my earnings because I'm earning at the rate R and I can retain part of the earning to grow at rate G. But if G is bigger than R, then by retaining earnings, full earnings, I can only grow at the rate of R. In order for me to grow at the rate of G, I need more money than just retain earnings. That means I need external equity, which means I need you. V is not enough. I need you, right? So case B will come to you and there you will see that I will also have external equity in the, in the, in the, in the optimal solution. In order for us to understand that, we're going to now go to case B. Okay. Let me now give you a solution of case B first. Because we can we are constructing that solution using this 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 analysis, reverse time switching point analysis. But this once we get done with it, we will have something like this. We will see that. From the beginning, if T is sufficiently large, okay, then we will have no dividend and we will earn some money. We will also have some equity from outside so that together with my own earnings, which is rate R, 
and a little bit more, more from outside with some cost of money that I pay because I only get a little bit. I, I need to make up, I want to grow the rate G. To go rate G, this gives me the rate of growth R. And if I, if I have no, if there is no cost of, if there is no, uh, if there is no flotation cost, if there is no, if there is no, if the, if the C is one, there's no flotation cost, then I only need to raise G minus R divided by R to make up for R, okay? Okay. So that and that will let me grow a red G. But then I stop growing a red G and I will only grow at red R because remember, so this is the growth out of retained earnings. And then at some point, just like before, I need time for the dividend to pay out to be worthwhile. But that's exactly tau one. At that point, I'll switch to u star equal to zero, v star equal to zero. So what is the switching time will give you? It will go here for b one. Then there will be a singular point, which we will show is going to be not sustainable. So b two is not sustainable. It will go to b three. B3, I'm company is growing at rate R. Okay. No dividend is given out yet. No actual equity is being issued, and I can grow at rate R. Then we will see that at this point, which is T minus, which is tau two on this side, tau two, I will switch and I will raise actual equity to rate faster than R. Why I switch here? Because here I will be indifferent between raising external equity and not raising external equity. Remember, V star is one year, V star is one year. So that continues. Dividends are still being paid out if fully. But external equity is zero here, external equity is not zero here. And here is the indifference point. That is the indifference point. If you go back to the table, you will see the indifference point. You see the indifference point right here. That's B4. We'll see the B4 will only be at one point when W1 equal to zero. And then we move to B, B, B5. So what we're gonna see here, the analysis will tell us analysis tell us that a tau one will switch to B3. A tau one will switch to B3 just for one moment in time, then go to B3. Then we go to B4 one moment in time, and then B5, and then B5 can continue forever. Why this point is on this side of tau one? <clears throat> well, this is the amount of, my, amount of time I need for $1 to be worthwhile of retained earnings. <clears throat> this amount of time, this amount of time, tau one plus tau two, I need that for one dollar of external equity to be worthwhile. Why I need more time? Because external equity is more expensive than return earnings. I pay the amount of money to the broker. So I need this amount of time to, to earn the broker's commission. Whatever I pay to the broker, I need more time to earn that commission because that's gone from the company. Okay, so I need a little bit of time for that, and then I go to here. And we will see that this tau two is, 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 is given by this formula. Tau two minus tau one is given by this formula. This is the time, this is the time, which is tau two is here, tau one is here. So this is tau two minus tau one, this time, right from here to here. That is the amount of time I need for me to pay the broker's commission. You can see the broker's commission is right coming here. So I need some time to earn the broker's commission and that is given by this formula. That formula is also being given by our control theory. Again, the switching time will give us this formula and later on we will derive this formula using finance argument. Okay, at this point, I believe we should take a five minute break. 
because I'm going to go to B1 and it will derive the formula tau2 intuitively. So let's take a break for um, right now it's 218. So let's get to 225. Is that okay? 225? 225, we are coming back. <laughs> 